in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. And this is after the Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, taken from there across the Kidron Valley up into the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and Simon Peter followed Jesus. And so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. That's John, by the way, Peter and John. But Peter stood at the door without or outside, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. I am not. Now back in Luke chapter 14, Luke 14, beginning with verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, that is Jesus, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest, haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much again for all that you have, all that you do, but especially all that you are. Father, I thank you for your word, and what it has for us here, even in these passages that step on our toes. Father, you have our good at heart as well as your glory. And Father, I pray you'd help us to see things here from your point of view, that you'd see ourselves from your point of view, that your Holy Spirit would take your word and apply it to our hearts and our lives, that you would search us and see if there be any wicked way in us, as David prayed, and help us, Father, to be responsive to you, to humble ourselves and respond in that fashion. Father, may you be lifted up, may I, be, may I decrease as you are glorified, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving, amen. I know the title today is probably a little bit strange to you. Um, you probably remember the movie, it came out, I don't know, when was it, in the 70s, uh, called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was a science fiction movie about... Uh, Meeting aliens. Um, I don't remember what all the different kinds are. They're, they're, this actually is a thing. It's a scientific thing. Uh, th those who study UFOs, and, and now UFOs back then were strictly theoretical. You know, it was a, almost a conspiracy theory. There were, there were all kinds of people who believed in UFOs, and it was, it was like, do you believe in ghosts type of thing? Because the government said, nah, there's no such thing as UFOs. You guys are nuts. You're seeing swamp gas. You're seeing satellites. You're seeing reflections off of Venus. I, there are all kinds of things that a number of people didn't believe and others did. But now the government has said, well, UFOs really do exist. And they have a department that studies these things. And then there's also a, a search for extraterrestrial intelligence which I find interesting. I'm still in search of terrestrial intelligence. But, um, but there are those who, who would like to encounter um, aliens, people who or whoever's driving these UFOs, and there's a first kind and a second kind. I guess the third kind is actually meeting them face to face, and that's what this movie was all about. 
there was a follow-up to it, a sequel to it. I don't know if you knew this was a sequel, but E.T. is a sequel to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's kind of the end of the story. That was the third kind. That's a close encounter with E.T. Now, what, what I'm, what am I, why am I talking about this on Sunday morning when I just read this passage about Peter, uh, whether he was a, d- a disciple or not, and what it takes to be a disciple? Because the world seems to have a fascination with, with encountering aliens from another world. But you know, it's not that far-fetched. <laughs> this whole book is about how to develop a close encounter with a being from another world, outside this world, right? Now, God exists in this world, but he's far beyond this world as well. He fills the entire universe, right? And he is not so transcendent that we can't be close to him. The whole point of this book is for God to communicate with us, his creation, and explain how he made us so that he could be with us. Of course, we blew it by disobeying him, and God separated himself from us. He sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and and God no longer fellowshiped with them in the Garden every day as he had before. But the whole point of the book from Genesis to Revelation is God's plan of restoring everything back the way it originally was intended. It ends with a garden, just like it began with a garden. It has a tree of life in it that Brother Otis referenced in his song just a little bit ago, the same one that was in the Garden of Eden. And the time in between is how we can get from one to the other. It's all about being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus Christ, having a close encounter of what the world calls the third kind with a God who loves us And is it so far off that he doesn't care about us or talk to us or want us to know about him? You know, most of the world's religions don't teach this. Most of the world's religions tell tell you, yeah, there is a God off somewhere in the far distance. And and if, if you do all the right things, you know, you can appease him. But but that's that that's that's so surface. God wants us to have a deep, personal not just an encounter, but a walk, a lifelong walk with God, right? So that's what we're talking about here today. Now, Peter was called to be a disciple. The word disciple means follower, but it means more than that as well. The Jews had a term for it, for, for being a follower, because they, they had disciples. There were disciples before Jesus. You realize that, right? All kinds of rabbis had disciples. They had followers, and I, I don't remember the exact term, but the concept was that, that to, to be a follower that had dust all over him. And the idea was you wanted to be so close a follower of the rabbi, the teacher, and Jesus is the ultimate rabbi, right? So to be close, so close a follower that the dust that the rabbi kicked up from his sandals as he walked through the dust would, would cover the disciples. And the more covered with dust you were, the closer you were to the, to the rabbi or whoever you were following and being a disciple of. So ultimately, we should be so close to the Lord, we're covered with the, with the spiritual dust that the Lord kicks up as he travels, right? That's what these disciples were. And, and this is actually what Peter was. Uh, the Lord called 12 disciples. Of those 12, there were three that were in the inner circle, Peter, James, John. Of those three, Peter was arguably the closest to him, right? Right? He was the one who swore that no matter what happened, no matter who left him, Peter says, I will never leave you. He just swore that just a few hours before this verse. And here he is following Jesus, not as closely as John, who actually went into the priest's house. Peter stayed outside, warmed himself by the fire, probably nervously wondering, what do we do now? What's going to happen? And this girl comes up and says, are, are you one of his disciples? What a golden opportunity. And he says, no, I'm not. The first of three denials made in a matter of minutes just before the rooster crowed the third time, just as Jesus had predicted, right? It was his opportunity and he blew it. So we want to talk about discipleship today. 
And, and there's four, just four major blanks. You see them there. And your first one is, what is a disciple? It's an important thing to talk about. I've already talked about it a little bit. What is a disciple? How can you tell if somebody is a disciple? Do they wear a label? Do we have to have a name tag? Did Peter have one? Hi, my name is Peter. I'm a disciple of Jesus. No. If he had one, he took it off, right? Threw it in the fire. But you can't tell because we wear a badge. How can someone tell if you are a disciple? How do you become one? In Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 19, we're told that we are to make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. That's kind of a misconception to a lot of believers because a lot of believers think we're supposed to go out and give people God's simple plan of salvation and get them to open it up to the third page and pray that prayer. That's our goal. We need to get people to pray the prayer of salvation. No, that's not what we're do, to do. That's part of what we're to do. But if we get people to pray the prayer of salvation and then walk away, we have failed the Lord. We have not fulfilled the Great Commission. We need to make disciples of them. That's what this verse says. It goes far beyond getting somebody to pray a prayer. So how do we know when we have made a disciple? How do we discover if we ourselves are a disciple? What is a disciple according to the New Testament? Well, the word disciple in the New Testament is usually a plural word. And the Greek definition I mentioned just a little bit ago, it's a learner a follower, an, an apprentice, a, 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 a partisan, a trainee, someone who is, is following someone else with the intention of becoming like that person that they're following. Professor D uh, Doug Kudelak of Baptist Bible College and Theological Seminary, Springfield, Missouri, points out three levels of commitment according to the Greek definition of the word disciple. He's a, quite a Greek scholar and uh, and professor, and, and used to live in, uh, in Israel. Uh, but anyway, he, he defines this, and we're going to go through these definitions as we look at these next three points. So let's look at a follower, a disciple of the first kind. That's your next blank, the first kind. The definition of this level is a person who is, quote, a mere interested follower, an enthusiast, a fan, without any real commitment to Jesus. This would be like the fan of a sports team uh, when they win the national championship or when they win the Super Bowl. And all of a sudden, you, you know the, t the team sales, the, the jersey sales of a team that wins the Super Bowl or wins the national championship, all of a sudden their sales go through the roof. People buy their hats, they buy their jerseys, they buy their stickers, they, they, they want to be identified with a winner, right? But those, many of those fans, now some of them are real fanatical fans. You know, believe it or not, other teams have fans like Ohio State has fanatical fans. They actually think their team is better. It's amazing. But, but they, they have followers, right? And Ohio State has followers, right? And there are people who buy Ohio State stuff who never went to Ohio State. They're just fans of Ohio State. Uh, but if a team doesn't win and they continue not to win, you find that their stuff is being worn less and less and less and less. That's what we're talking about with this first kind of disciple of Jesus. There are fans of Jesus. There are people who latch on to him and think, well, Jesus is pretty cool. You know, he was a good teacher. Yeah, he's a good guy to follow. He's kind of a good guy to be like. And they learn a little bit more about him, maybe read a little bit more about him. But then that enthusiasm wears off after a while. Maybe they're not as fanatical as they were at the beginning. They're not as dedicated as they were at the beginning. And they stop reading about him. And maybe when they learn a little bit more about him, maybe they don't want to be like him. They might read a passage like this. It says, says that if you, if you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. And there, there were many who turned away from Jesus and walked no more with him when they heard stuff like that. And there are many people today who still feel that way. Well, wait a minute, you know, I'll follow Jesus, but I'm not going to give this up. I'm not going to give that up. I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm going I'm to do what I want to do. 
If I can follow Jesus and still do what I want to do, then, I can, then I'll follow him. But I'm not going to quit doing this and doing that. You guys, you guys are crazy. Have you experienced that before? Have you heard that before? I have. I've had many people tell me, hey, I, 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 I'm not going to be a Christian. I, I, you, you guys don't have any fun. You have to give up this. You have to give up that. You have to give up the other thing. Well, I, I've never given anything up for religion. Well, actually, I take that back. When I used to be religious, when we grew up, you know, when it came to Lent, I would, I would give things up, like broccoli, you know. But then I learned to love broccoli. Then, then, then I wouldn't give broccoli up anymore. But, but, <clears throat> but that's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, folks who, who are just uh, temporary followers of Jesus. They start out with the good intentions and maybe all kinds of enthusiasm, all kinds of excitement, and they're on fire for a while, but then they fade out, and then they leave, and you don't see them anymore. Those of you who have been here for a long period of time, you've seen numerous people come into this church, Columbus Baptist Temple or Crossroads Baptist Church. You've seen people jump in with both feet and just want to do this and want to do that and do the other thing, and they're just on fire for a while. Where are they now? Well, that's not a new problem. First John talks about this. John, the other disciple that, that we just read about, he wrote not only the book of John, he also wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and also Revelation. But he writes in 1 John 2.19, he says this, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, I have uh, quoted some scripture uh, here before. Well, not quoted scripture, quoted some pastors is what I meant to say. <clears throat> and I, I've done this, this frequently. In fact, I just had a conversation with somebody about this this week. Some of the pastors of the biggest churches in America, uh, say 50, 60 years ago. Uh, W.A. Criswell, for example, who pastored First Baptist Church in Dallas, uh, where Robert Jeffers is today. You hear him on the radio all the time. That, that's, all, that's been a big church for many, many decades, a premier church. W.A. Criswell was pastor of that when it, when it was four or 5,000 people showed up in the auditorium every single week. And he said this. He wrote it in a book. He said, 80 to 85% of our church members at First Baptist Dallas are not saved. Well, that's scary, isn't it? I mean, he was a great preacher, a great pastor, a great proclaimer of the Word of God. He was evangelistic. In fact, he traveled all over the country evangelizing as well as pastoring in First Baptist Dallas. People sat under his ministry and heard the gospel every single Sunday. And he was there over 50 years. And yet he said that the vast majority of his congregation were lost and on their way to hell. That is scary to me. And he's not the only pastor like that who said that. I could quote three or four other pastors of similarly large churches who have had similarly long ministries, who are similarly uh, evangelistic and said the same thing. The statistics are very close. Usually between 80 and 90% is what they would say of their members were unsaved people. And so what that tells us is that not everybody who claims to be a disciple is a disciple. Now, we see this in Scripture also if we look at the book of Matthew. The first parable that we see there in the book of Matthew is the parable of the sower and the seed. You might recall that. We're not going to take time to read that. That's kind of a lengthy uh, parable, and then he explains it at length even more at the end of that chapter, but it's very, very telling. He talks about one sower who takes the seed. The seed is the Word of God. Of course, the sower is the Lord, right? And he goes out and he sows the seed. And he's doing do it by hand. You know, back then, they had a big, would ha have a big bag uh, full of seed, kind of like newspaper boys used to have, a great big bag with a sling, uh, slung over their shoulder like this, and he would reach down there with, with handfuls, and he'd take it and he'd sprinkle it like this. And he sprinkled it on four different types of soil. The first type of soil was stony soil, where the seed might take root for just a short time and grow up, but the, but the, but the dirt is shallow, 
It's, it's pretty rocky, and, and the, 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 the seed doesn't last. That's what we're talking about here. That's an illustration of, of those who, who make a quick claim to wanting to know the Lord or following the Lord, being a disciple, but they don't last. These are disciples, followers, but yet without commitment or conversion or continuance. Think of Judas Iscariot. The Lord called Judas Iscariot to be a disciple, didn't he? Not only that, but he was called to be an apostle. One of 12 apostles, the only 12 apostles who ever have existed on the planet or ever will exist. There were only, and still are, only 12. Judas was one of those 12. Judas was given authority and power by the Lord to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. And he was lost. He was the son of perdition. He went to, we're told, his own place. So the Lord replaced him with the Apostle Paul. Quite a contrast. But Judas is the type of disciple we're talking about here, a disciple of the first kind. One who outwardly looked like a, a true disciple. None of the other 11 ever, ever, ever questioned Judas's sincerity or his commitment or his faith. He was just like them. For all outward appearances, he was just like them. It is possible for someone to look and act, sound, smell like a disciple today and not be one. That's the first kind. John 6, verse 6, 6 through 6, 9 from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him. <laughs> Here's Simon Peter. This is the good side of him. Okay, He answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe, he's speaking on behalf of the other disciples, he says, We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter believed that, right? He thought Judas believed it too, right? He's speaking on behalf of all of them. We believe this, he says. So he, he was making this public confession that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he is the Redeemer. So how do you know if you're a disciple or not? Well, there's a little test here. Just kind of take it. Don't raise your hand. But are you known as a Christian to your friends and family? The word Christian means Christ-like, Christ-like, like Jesus. Are you known as a Christian to your friends and family? It's your family probably is the most important one. Are you the same person at home that you are at church? You know, are you consistent in your life? Do those closest to you know you as a Christian? Number two, do others ask you what the Bible says about this and that? These are not my rules. These are from someone else. But these, these are rules for discipleship. Do others ask you what the Bible says about this and that? Do, number three, do others ask you to pray at lunch or dinner when you go out to a restaurant? Maybe Thanksgiving, Christmas. Are you the one that's called on to pray? Are you the one that's been, being asked to pray about, about anything? Do people come to you and say, hey, you know, I've got this issue going on or I've got a friend who's got this going on. Would you pray for them? Do people ask you to do that? Number four, do other people ask you for spiritual advice when they experience a crisis? This is, this is not just for pastors. This is for all believers. Do others ask you for spiritual advice when they experience a crisis? On the other hand, do you have a difficult time getting other people to come to church with you? Has anyone been surprised when you said you're a Christian or go to church? Has anyone been surprised at something you did or said because you're supposed to be a Christian? You know, uh, when you go to the doctor, I don't know when was the last time you went, but one of the things that a doctor does is they will, they will poke you, and you'll thump on you, they'll listen to your chest and they'll listen to your back, they'll look in your ears, they might look up your nose, right? Tell you to open your mouth, stick out your tongue and say, uh, why do they do that? I have no idea, but somehow looking at the tongue helps. It's an indication of, of something, right? Uh, looking at your tongue is an indication of your health. 
I'm not a doctor. I don't know. You know, people stick their tongue out at me. It's usually not a good sign, right? Uh, it might be a sign their nose is about to be in trouble, but uh, no. No, but the same is true spiritually. Your tongue is an indicator of your spiritual health. Not by sticking it out, but how you use it. Let's look at number two, a disciple of the second kind. A disciple of the second kind. These blanks are going to be easy for you to fill out today, aren't they? Probably also already got the next one filled out, don't you? (laughs) So disciple of the second kind. The definition of this is someone who is truly converted, a real believer, but untrained. Untrained. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and what? Learn of me, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Boy, that sounds so easy, doesn't it? Just take my yoke upon you, he says. You shall find rest of yours under your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But, you, but most people forget that that three-letter phrase is in there, learn of me. Learn of me. We have to be learn. We have, we have to learn to be like Jesus. It doesn't just happen. You don't just pray the sinner's prayer and presto changeo. You're, you're instant saint. You know, you're the super Christian. Just pull up your shirt, and and there's a big S there. I'm super Christian. I can pray. I'm going to heaven. I've got a mansion in heaven. I'm going to be like Jesus. I've got all the power of the apostles. I can do whatever a Christian needs to do. No, you have to learn those things. You just got born again. And newborn infants can't do anything for themselves. It takes a long time for them just to learn to feed themselves. New Christians have to come to church to learn what the Bible says. They have to go to Bible study to learn more about what the Bible says. They have to be discipled to understand what the Bible says. But if you are still at the point where you're not feeding yourself by being in your Bible every day, by studying it for yourself and learning for yourself, if you're not at that point yet, you're still a baby Christian. I don't care how long you've been saved. All of us need to learn to be Christ-like. The word Christian is an adjective. Keep in mind, it's not a noun. You don't be a Christian, you are Christ-like. You have to learn to be Christ-like. You have to learn what Jesus, what, what made Jesus tick. Can I put it that way? We have to learn not only what he thinks, but why he thinks the way he does. How he, uh, how he, thinks what he values we have to learn that luke 640 says this the disciple is not above his master but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master that word perfect doesn't mean sinless doesn't mean perfect like we think of perfect the word perfect means complete everyone that is complete shall be as his master that is like jesus we need to be so much like Jesus, we've got his dust all over us. Instead of just being the dust that we are, that we're made of, and we are, we're all made of the dust of the ground, right? We're all going to return to the dust of the ground. But we need to have his dust on us. We need to be that close to him. This level of discipleship requires humility. It requires repentance. It requires unconditional surrender. It requires both trust and commitment to Jesus. Trust and commitment. It's not enough just to trust in Jesus. You have to be committed to Him as well. I mean a lifelong commitment. I'll give you two examples. There's two blanks here. The first one is the prodigal. Luke chapter 15. Remember when the prodigal son, uh, he, he, he was young, he was brash, he was stupid, he was selfish. He wanted what was coming to him and then he left home and he blew it all. He lost his money, he lost his friends, he lost his faith, because as a Jewish kid, he should, he should never have been working for a Gentile, for one thing, and he sh- should never have been working on a pig farm, for the second thing, but he ended up doing both. He ended up working for a Gentile, which was anathema for a Jew, and working with pigs, which was even worse. 
And he was, he was eating the stuff the pigs eat. He had his head down in the trough eating the slop. And finally realized, it came to himself, the scripture says. He said, what am I doing here? And he said, he prepared a speech for his, for his father. He said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, now he's talking to his dad, but you know what the story's about. It's about us returning to God the Father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's a key phrase. This was his problem. He felt worthy to be called the son of God. I'm not talking about Jesus, but you and I, according to John chapter 1, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believed on his name. You, if you have believed on Jesus Christ, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a son of God, a child of God. But don't ever get to the point where you think you're worthy to be one. That's what his problem was. This is why believers or people who claim to be believers go out and, and live like the devil all week long, talk like the devil, post it on Facebook, and you have no idea what the difference is between a Christian and a non-Christian because you can't tell it from them because they are, and, and I believe a lot of these people are saved, and, but their, their view is, hey, I am a son of God. I don't have to change my life this and that and the other way. I can do what I want. I can continue to say what I want. I continue to act, continue to act like I did before. I'm saved. That's all that matters. No, it's not. No, it's not. He said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Oh, he finally got it. He finally got it. Until you get to that point, like the prodigal, when he finally realized he wasn't worthy to be his father's son, he said, make me as one of thy hired servants. In other words, he says, I am committing myself to you, Father, to be your servant. I know I'm your son, but I want to be your servant. Boy, I wish a whole lot of Christians would get a hold of that. And not just do lip service to God. Not just tip God an hour a week by being in church on Sunday, but by considering themselves their father's servant. We are bought with a price. We owe him at least that. Paul said, which is your reasonable service, right? Give yourselves a living sacrifice to God. It's the least we can do. The second blank there, first is the prodigal. The second one is the publican, publican. I'm not getting political here. <laughs> That's publican. Luke 18, 13. And the publican said, remember the, the, it was, this was the Pharisee and the publican. They went up in the temple to pray. Jesus said two men went up in the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a publican. The Pharisee prayed thus with himself. Father, I thank thee that I'm not like other people. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of everything I own. But the other guy, this is the other guy, the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Now, it was, it was typical back then. This is the way most people prayed, most Jewish people. This is their custom in praying. They would lift up their hands and look up into heaven like this. This is the way Jesus prayed sometimes when he, when he would break bread with the disciples. He, he would pray like this, lift up his hands and look up into heaven. That was the typical posture for prayer for an Orthodox Jew. But this guy wouldn't do that. He wouldn't even look up. He, look, he just kept his head down, a very humble attitude. He wouldn't lift up his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this man went home justified rather than the other. This is the attitude we are to take. Yes, we are saved. Yes, we are sons of God, but we're still sinners. We're just forgiven sinners. We're no better than anybody else. But we need to consider ourselves disciples, followers of Jesus. Now, there are many people who get to this point, but they never get past it. They don't continue to grow. They're saved. 
but they're not fully committed to the Lord. They don't really grow. They stay in the same place. A pastor I had years ago said that they're, they're, they might, might have been saved for 20 years, but they're really only one year old. They don't continue to grow. We, we know about uh, people today who are developmentally disabled, right? That's exactly what we're talking about with spiritual believers. Many believers, Christians, are developmentally disabled. They will not grow past a certain point. Now, they can. The reason they don't grow past a certain point is because they don't want to. They're happy where they are. They're satisfied with where they are. Now, church's mission is not only to win the lost, but our primary mission as a church is to take mere converts and turn them into disciples. Make disciples of these folks. Make them true followers of Jesus. And this is where we see it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That is our job. We all need to be at the point where, where we will share what we know and what we are with other people who are faithful that they can go and teach others also. If we're not doing that, th then, then we're, what are we doing? I mean, we're not just here to soak up. We're here to serve, all of us, right? We need to be passing on what we know and who we are to other people. If we don't, Christianity will die with us. We are the last generation of Christianity on earth. Now, I'm not saying that because I think the Lord's coming back next year. What I just said has always been true. It was true 500 years ago. That generation was the last generation of Christians on earth. The reason we're here is because they passed on their faith to somebody else, who passed it on to somebody else, who passed it on to somebody else. And it eventually got to us. It got to me. It got to you. If it's going to continue for our great-grandkids... We have to pass it on to others who will pass it on to others. Who will pass it on to others. That's the way Christianity will continue. It's only by word of mouth. Number, point number four, a disciple of the third kind. This is a person who is truly converted, trained, taught, and prepared to win and train others. Can you share your faith with other people? Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to tell other people not only what you believe, but why you believe it? This is very, very important for us to know how to do that. We need to be able, especially in a world like this, where the world, world is so divided and so hung up on things that don't matter, things uh, uh, that are about money and about culture and about uh, government, about uh, world news, all, all the things that are going on in the world around us. And there's very little interest in spiritual things, things of eternal value. You and I, if you know the Bible, if you know the Lord, you know the truth about the world you're living in, right? You can see things from God's point of view, or at least I hope you can. We need to be able to understand the things of the world around us from God's point of view, and we need to be able to share our faith with other people. When we tell people, uh, hey, I'm a Christian, other people don't always know what that means. They used to. Used to be most people in this country went to church somewhere, and they knew basically what you're talking about. But you know, most people today have no clue what the Bible says about anything. A lot of their faith and belief, when I say faith, the things that they trust in, the things that they believe, the values they hold, come from other things than the Bible. They hear it from what they see in the news, what they hear it from their friends at the water cooler at work, what they were taught growing up or taught in school. 
And a lot of it, most of it, is absolutely false. Can you tell people not only what you believe and what your values are, but why you believe those? Why your values are correct and why other values are not? All of us need to be able to do that. But the cost of discipleship is extremely high. Did you know that? It's not cheap to be a disciple. Luke 14, that passage we just, we just read, uh, the Lord explained all that. He says, you've got to count the cost. If you're going to build a building, you've got to know what it's going to cost. Because if you're not prepared to pay the full cost, you're, you're going to end up with, with maybe just a shell of a building, and it's not going to be finished, and you're going to have to leave it, abandon it, and, and everybody's going to look at it and laugh at you and say, yeah, he, he, he started to build this thing, and he had great hopes for it, but it, he never could finish it, couldn't afford to finish it. There are numerous cases of that. Uh, I don't want to take time to, to do that, but there are some tourist sites around Ohio. You can go visit things where somebody really had this idea to build this castle or this building and, and never finished it because they could, didn't have the money. I know of a couple instances where that happened. Brother Emmett Shea, uh, who's out of our church and pastors right down the street here, that's how he got the building he got because a church wanted to build a, 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 a church building down there, and they ran out of money halfway through. All they had was a shell and a slab. There was nothing else done, nothing done on the inside. No utilities in it at all, no furnace, no water. They didn't have anything. So he got it pretty cheap, put, put money in it to finish it, but that other church didn't have money to finish it. I know a big building down in Springfield, Missouri years ago, a great, big, beautiful building, and it was uh, partially done. They ran out of money, and they had to sell it to somebody else, get what they could out of it. Same way with us. If we're going to be a disciple, we can't do it halfway. We need to count the cost. We need to be willing to pay the price, and the price is high. The song says, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? Sing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. What's the rest of it? No turning back. Is that just a song? Or do we mean it? No turning back. No turning back. Uh, follow me, Jesus says. And he means voluntary death to self, death to my plans, death to my will, death to life. Folks, as disciples, we reserve nothing. We hold nothing back. All my time, my energy, my resources, my money, it's all his. It's not mine. Everything we have is his. When we have an offering and I say we give back to the Lord of that which is his own, that is absolutely true. Everything you have came from God. What did you have when you came in this world? Nothing. You didn't even have any clothes. No bippy. Is that still a term? You didn't have anything, right? Nothing. What do you have now? Well, thank God you got clothes on, right? You still don't have a bippy, but you have clothes? Anybody sleep out in the open last night? You all had a roof over your head? Uh, does it look like anybody's missed a meal lately? God's taking care of us, right? Everything we have is from God. Everything we have is more than we deserve. God takes care of our needs, our food, shelter, clothing, right? He promised that, Matthew chapter 6. But do you have more than your necessary food? Do you have more than your necessary clothes? I mean, do you have more than one outfit at home in your closet? Yeah. God has blessed us. We need to realize that everything we have comes from him. Colossians 1.18 says he is the head of the body, the church, and he, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is to have the preeminence in every area of our life, every thought, every word, every action, everywhere we go, all the time. Amen? That's what discipleship is. To be a disciple of the third kind, here's your last three blanks very quickly. To be a disciple of the third kind means first, instruction. Learn of me. 
Second, it means submission. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Third, it means introspection. Let a man examine himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let a man examine himself, it says. Becoming a close disciple of Jesus Christ might require a complete reprioritizing of your life. And we have to be introspective of ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, what do I spend my time and money doing? Do I give God the leftovers or does he have the priority? Do I allow other people to influence me and control me, control my thoughts, control my time, control my actions? What do I allow to influence me? Where, what do I watch? What do I listen to? What do I read? Are those things pleasing to God? Folks, you, uh, now some of you are old enough to remember this. Some of you aren't. But years ago, there used to be a recruiting poster, an army recruiting poster, and it had a picture of Uncle Sam with his finger pointed right at you. And it said, Uncle Sam wants you. Remember that? Great Britain, they had one very similar. A uh, poster uh, pointed, pointed at the person and says, you know, we, King wants you. Picture God pointing you at, at you. Jesus Christ pointing at you and saying, I want you to be my disciple. Because that's exactly what he's saying here. What is your response? You know, God can use you in a great way. He wants to do that. Sticks and stones and donkey bones, pots of water, manna in the sky, quails on the wing and pigs on the fly, Josh's, Joshua's long day, a little bit of spit and a handful of clay, a den of lions, a furnace of fire, a rooster's bold crowing and an angelic choir, a floating axe head and a cripple carrying his bed. A star in the east, a Babylonian feast with riding in the wall and Jericho's fall, rough wood and some nails, a cat of nine tails, a rock-hewn tomb, merely a borrowed room. God seems to joy in deploying small stuff, unexpectedly used as diamonds in the rough. But as I reflect, I realize the unusual choice God used even as his heart, his hand, his voice. That's you and me. God likes to use us. You may think you don't have much to offer, but offer him what you have. Offer him you, all of you. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I don't know what the Lord's purpose is in your life right here, right now, today. I know that one of them is for every single one of us to be completely sold out as his disciple. I'm talking about a close disciple. Not follower far off like Peter was during this passage here, but close enough that his dust kicks up on us where we want to be like him. The world has yet to see, and I'm not, this is not an original quote with me, but it's still true today. The world has still yet to see what can be done with a small group of people who are sold out, dedicated to God. God can use you and this church in a mightier way than he can huge cathedrals and temples and mega churches where the vast majority of them are not saved. God can use you and this group right here in this room to change the world. Are you a disciple of the third kind? Father, thank you so much for being who you are. May your will be done in our lives, especially may your will be done in this invitation in the next couple of minutes where we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. Whatever the need, you come. There's folks down here. They'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like them to do so. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first
us water and grace will lead me on when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun Thank you very much. Just very, uh, uh, very quickly, m let me mention that we will have 2020 tonight at six o'clock, unless we have a storm. There's a, there's a chance that that snow could come in and and hit. I don't know what time it's supposed to come. I've been here uh, seeing different things. I didn't look at it today, so I don't know what the most recent forecast is. But if we get the snow, then don't worry about it. Uh, but otherwise, we will have 2020 tonight, and then next Sunday morning we will have our annual business meeting as part of the morning service. We won't keep you a long time. We will have a, a, a normal service, but we're going to shorten it just a little bit so that we can have, still have a morning uh, business meeting and still get to lunch at, at the usual time. Okay? And we will start a new series next week. And, and let's, I may change it because of the shortness, but I'm starting a new series called <coughs> The Rest of the Story. Uh, that'll, that'll last for six weeks. And right now it's planned for next Sunday morning, but I may, pu I may push that back a little bit because of the the meeting. I haven't decided that yet. So anyway, let's go to the Lord and pray. Oh, yes. Okay, contribution statements are available in the back. Tammy will be back there after the service to help you with that. And there's also an announcement here about Biggest Loser starting today. Is that from last week or is that today? It starts today. Okay, let me mention this then. Um, the Biggest Loser will start today, the contest, uh, weight loss contest. Uh, I'm anxious for the Biggest Winner contest. When is the Biggest Winner contest? Okay, never mind. <laughs> biggest loser contest. <coughs> that's what we're focused on. Is to, and that's going to go uh, starting today and goes till April 10th. That's Easter. <coughs> the winner will be announced on Easter Sunday. There's going to be a short meeting right after the service in the connector, and it will also be the first drum roll. Way in. Okay. Scariest words I ever thought. So anyway, <coughs> I remember I was at the doctor.